Good morning and welcome to Crossroads United Methodist Church on, online. We're glad that you've decided to join us this Sunday. A few announcements before we, we begin. Uh, a few of us are traveling down to Haywood Street United Methodist Church September 21st through the 23rd. If you would like to join us to see what that United Methodist Church is doing to address the issues in their community in Appalachia, there's still time for you to get online. Let me know. Don at crossroads120.org if you'd like to join us for that three-day trip down to Haywood Street United Methodist Church in Asheville, North Carolina. The cost is $130 a person that covers your lodging and meals for the time, and we hope that you're able to join us for those days. And now, friends, as we engage worship and we cover the topic of singing and worship, I now invite you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship this morning. The past few weeks, uh, I was on vacation and Reverend Kara, I hope you enjoyed her message here a couple of weeks ago. We had, and I had been talking to you about worship, various aspects in worship. We've talked about prayers of the people, the need for confession and worship, how uh, the importance, just the need, uh, the good thing that it happens when we do worship. And so for today's text, I kind of cherry picked a, a verse from Acts 16, verse 23 and 24. Five, and it reads here in the book of Acts, after they, Paul and Silas, had been given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he had put them into the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying 
and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. May God add a blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and the living of his holy word. Thanks be to God. It seemed odd to me uh, that we should talk about worship and not talk about music. And to be upfront, I've experienced worship services all across the world in probably almost every single form that you could think of, both Christian and non-Christian. I've been in Buddhist and Muslim uh, services, Jewish services, uh, uh, and obviously any number of Christian worship services where I, I've experienced a diverse array of music in those. While I grew up in a traditional church, probably like this one, where we grew up with a tradition of hymn singing, um, you know, I've been in churches, uh, contemporary churches, or churches that sang songs, or where people spoke in tongues. And so, all to say that uh, in all of those experiences, uh, innumerable experiences of worship all across the world, um, I've experienced good music and bad music in church. And I know this sounds harsh to say in church, but the truth is I've experienced uh, good traditional music in church and bad traditional music in church. I've experienced good contemporary music in church and bad contemporary music in church. And this is not a message about the right way to worship because one of my experience with that diverse array of religious experiences all across the world has led me to believe that there is no right way to do it. Uh, I do wish to say a couple of things about how we do it here at Crossroads. And this is a hymn singing church, much in the way that I was raised in. We use, the, we are heavy into the United Methodist hymnal that was published in 1989. And that has any number of songs in it uh, dating back centuries. And so uh, while again, there's no right way to worship, and I'm not one to get into the debate about which one is better over top of the other. I have been moved to tears in traditional worship, and I have been moved to tears in worship that was very contemporary and much unlike the upbringing that I had. There is no right way to worship. And as we've been engaging each element of worship, as we talked over the past couple of weeks here in person, uh, part of me doing that is to say, well, why do we do this here our, you know, in our faith community here at Crossroads United Methodist Church. And if you come to our in-person service here, you will experience a uh, hymn singing, much like if you went to church as a kid, it, it, much of that probably hasn't changed. And I want to give you three really good reasons that, that why we do that here. The first is, uh, first is pretty simple. Hymn singing uh, is beautiful and it introduces us to some of the greatest music ever written. And that when we sing songs that somebody wrote either centuries ago, we can acknowledge the beauty that was in the world and give thanks for the beauty that brought into the world as a result of what those composers and musics and give thanks for all the you know millions of people who have sung that hymn all the way up until that time. It also helps and engages and stimulates our brains to learn about music that we don't hear in popular culture uh, today. It introduces us to a classical style of music, though while written in that time was probably much like the music of its day, uh, is so much different. I remember talking to uh, one, uh, uh, an individual who had been coming to church here for some time, who, who as I like to say, uh, was sleeping on holy ground the night before. It was one of our uh, homeless gentlemen to come in here. And one of the reasons he enjoyed coming to church here on a Sunday is because he felt that in such a chaotic world that he should enter a world that had some service and that offered something um, starkly different than the world that he had experienced on the outside. And in many ways, hymn singing today, while it was mud written in the way that people sung music in those days today, it is probably different. Well, I know that it's a lot different than the music we hear uh, on the radio or when, when we stream or wherever that you get your music. And that that can be a beautiful, stark difference to what we hear on the outside, and it offers beauty to the world. That's the first reason I wanted to give you. Pretty simple. The second reason I wanted to give you is that, uh, and it's probably something we don't think about very often, that with the decline of hymn singing in places like the United States and the West, um, we are losing a common language. This is to say the reason that we do it is that hymns give us a common language that bring us closer together. And here's what I mean by that. I remember traveling to Cambodia a few years ago, and obviously I don't speak Khmer, and I did not really know what was going on in that worship service. I mean, I, I knew generally that people were reading the Bible. I knew there was a message being given, uh, but I had no idea what they were saying. And when they got up to sing their final hymn, um, it was interesting that the English folks could join in right away to the first verse of How Great Thou Art. Uh, as they sang it in Khmer, and many of us in our little group would sing it in English. And in a way, it 
bound us in a way, in a distinct moment in time in that worship service where we felt pretty disconnected or we were sitting there with everybody, we all of a sudden found together, here's something we have in common. And I would argue even here in the United States, when there was so much political division in our country, that having things like hymns, songs like how great thou art, art come, how come thou found of every blessing and amazing grace. These are words that are part of our common humanity and common experience. And they bind us together with people who might think very different things than us. And that's something that we shouldn't be so quick to discard in our worship services because they are one of the last piece of common language we have, even amongst Christian denominations who really don't get along. Baptists sing them and Methodists can sing them and Presbyterians and non-denominational churches can continue to sing the words of songs that bind us together because it gives us a common language and I think brings us closer together. The third reason I wanted to bring to you about why we sing hymns here at Crossroads is that when we do this, we're a bridge who passes them on to the next generation. We are the they. And so sometimes we open up our hymnal and we see that this song or these words have been lasted, you know, since the year 1400, 1600, hundreds of years. Uh, that doesn't happen just because, you know, they're in a book. It happens when we sing them and we mean them and our children hear them singing this and that they imbue those words and those tunes are imbued upon their hearts and they feel something meaningful just as the many generations before have sung it and then it gets passed on to the next generation. One of my favorite things to do with my children this night is to engage in some form of hymn singing. You know, we are a bunch of hillbillies in our house who live on a farm, so I often sing country music, but every now and then uh, in uh, the worship in, in the bedtime routine uh, with my kids on top of songs, uh, Randy Travis songs and George Strait songs and George Jones songs that we sing before they go to bed or, or uh, James Taylor is a, a common one comes and uh, a come thou fount of every blessing comes an O come thou traveler unknown comes uh, a, 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 any number of hymns, uh, amazing grace and all the verses. Uh, I, I remember very distinctly that my second son, Luke, uh, fell in love with the song, uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Uh, but he didn't know it by the I, I never. I don't think I ever told him uh, the name of the song. And so he would simply request at night, Dad, can you sing the morning by morning song? And for those of you who remember that hymn, uh, that line that says, And morning by morning, new mercies I see. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. But he knew it as not as great as thy faithfulness, the, which just stuck out to me that that was the part that stuck into my son's heart. The part that said morning by morning, new mercies I see. I want to close with just two quick stories. The first one is I was visiting at my very first appointment on my first charge. I was visiting um, an older woman in her 90s. Uh, and again, these songs are passed on from generation to generation. And something that I do, especially uh, with that generation, I take my hymnal into the hospice rooms uh, because sometimes folks with Alzheimer's and dementia, folks who have uh, no folks, uh, a lot of times when, when memory goes, it's interesting that many times the hymns have stayed. And so while we may not have, be able to have common reference, she may not remember that I was her pastor or even remember many of the children in the room, I can bring a hymnal in and sing songs like Amazing Grace and sing How Great is, uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness and sing these songs and they remember the words, they remember the tunes and we can share in this holy moment together even near the end of their life. And there's one particular woman uh, who at that time, I didn't know then, was just days away from passing, but she could still uh, talk while she was in hospice. And I sang a few songs that I pulled out of the hymnal, songs that I liked, songs that I knew, and songs that I felt like I could sing halfway decent. And she asked me uh, at that day, she goes, do you know the song, Shall We Gather at the River? And I said, well, actually, I, I don't. And she grabbed my hand and she said, learn it. And so I did. I went home, you know, played the song, listened to it in my car, and came back. And a day before she passed, got the shared experience of having learned that song and sang that song with her a day before she passed. Last story before we close here. I was in a hospice room of another woman. And in this particular room, um, the room was shared between her and her roommate. I had been paying many visits to this woman who's a member of our church. Um, 
and honestly uh, had, had not paid that much attention about the woman on the other side of the curtain. And at this particular time, I had brought my hymnal in to start singing. And I started singing the song, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. If you know, they're a precious fountain till my raptured soul shall find. And at that moment, when I was singing that song, not the woman I was singing to, but the woman on the other side of the curtain began singing, rest beyond the river. And so I just kept singing until all three of our voices began to get to that chorus that said, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. I know I said I only had three reasons. Here's my fourth, though. We keep a song on our lips, whether traditional, hymn, or contemporary, it doesn't matter. When we, Christians, when we keep a song on our lips to raise our spirits and join our hearts with God, you truly never know who else is listening. You go back to Acts 16 and verse 25, we read those words about midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners we're listening. Friends, we keep a song on our lips, raise our spirits and join our hearts with God because we truly never know who else is listening. Let us pray. Loving God, uh, someone once said that when we sing, we pray twice. We pray that our songs uh, bring joy to you, bring joy to the world around us and draw us closer to you and to one another. Help us to keep a song on our lips despite the hardships that come, knowing that you were the one who sang the most beautiful song of all on that cross as you opened your arms out for us and embraced us in your immeasurable love. Help us, dear God, to keep a song on our lips at all times. And in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, keep singing. Go in peace, and we'll see you back here next week.